Hello, people. Um, yeah, b a bit of a change, right? I think ye, ye old microphone, which I was just using my old headset, I think it died. Now, maybe I should have paid more attention. I feel like maybe the last two videos have been a little low. I didn't, uh, in, in the editing that I have, it sounded okay. And then I guess when it uploaded, it sounded weird, or maybe I just didn't notice. That's my bad. Or maybe it was the recent update. I, I'm not exactly sure what's happening, but I came on today and I gave it a test run, and this one sounded atrocious. And so I don't have another mic. So what I what I have is a pair of headphones with a microphone on it, right? Little, little Sony headphones. They're not bad. Now, I had it in my ear like normal, and it hangs down around here, and I felt like I had to kind of shout. And I'm like, that's no good. That's not going to work. I don't want to be shouting. Plus, I might mess up and stop shouting midway through the video because I forgot. So, I'm, I'm doing it old school microphone style, I guess. And let's hope I don't, you know, let's hope I don't forget to hold it up. Or I hope it don't make noise when I crinkle or mess with it. <sighs> drama. The drama of YouTubing. I'm going to have to find a decent mic that I can attach to this iPad. This iPad's the way I record these videos because it has it has the editing equipment on there. Right? Now, it's not a lot of editing, right? It's not, you know, top tier, but it's what I do. I'd like to be consistent. Okay. Okay, it's sort of the the issue out of the way. Today, this week, now I hadn't even planned on this, but it sort of I got caught up in it. This week's book is Leviathan Wakes. I'm checking my notes when I look down. We're still in this horrible notepad that we hate because it's plastic and it fights you. Leviathan Wakes which is you know okay it's from the it's from the expanse series should i just hold this or is it cold and dangling get distracted more yeah that that that's good for the video <laughs> it's from the leviathan wake series now i've seen the show and i'd like the show i haven't finished the show i don't know the end i think maybe a season or two i have to do and i was just sort of in my mind, because the sh because the book was so good, I mean the show was good. I was like, do I want to finish the show, or do I want to wait and then you know read the books? You have this decision to make. I've decided to wait, and then I was debating right because this is the debate us readers get into. I think we've all experienced this. I mean at least once or twice. You see a series. And you hear about it, and you you know, or you read the cover or the back, and you're slightly interested. But then you look, and it's what is the Dresden Files? The Dresden Files was like 46 books long. That's a commitment, right? You you don't want to. I don't want to at least start book one and two and be like, man, I really like this. But I also don't want to spend four thousand dollars on you know 150 of these books. Or maybe I do. Maybe it's just that good. Right? So, you know, that comes into play. Now, The Expanse is a newer book, so you're going to pay, you're going to pay the pretty penny. You don't, you don't find these in second-hand stores and whatnot. Tolkien, even, even, even Lord of the Rings I can find second-hand. I, I think I have a copy of The Hobbit that was $3. That, that, that don't kill me. Now, I pay full price for Lord of the Rings because it's fantastic. But you don't know going in, right? Of that, you can read reviews, you can try, but you don't really know. In any case, I committed. I actually bought this book. It's one I purchased on Audible. I'm rating this bad boy a 5 out of 5. I think it's written in such a way that even your normie friends, right? People who don't read, non-readers if you will, can get into and like this book. And then the five also comes with, if you are a reader, is there enough meat on the bone for you for, to warrant, you know, the purchase, the commitment, 
however you want to see. And I think I think that there is. It does both. It's one of the best modern sci-fi's I've read. All right. So why is it so good? Let me see if I can. I'm gonna try and streamline my thoughts a little bit and not get too out of out of hand. But we we have this. I have old school. I have retro science fiction books, right? Now, uh, your Asimovs, right? Hyperion, these kind of things. They, it's written in the 60s. They have a different overall mentality. And I would say it's more macro. We, we think of these wider pictures and our, we concern ourselves less with the individual. He deals with things. Versus nowadays, where I think our audiences, of people, in America at least, are more personal. Which is, you would think it would be the opposite. With the internet age, and with, you know, all these connections all over everywhere, you'd think it would be more impersonal. But we're in, weirdly, the inverse has happened. I feel like societies can relate to individual things much better than these broad scoping ideas. So our, our story comes at us sort of individually. We alternate chapters between Holden, El Capitan, ship captain, and a detective named Miller. And in, e in each episode, in each chapter, we might even be covering the same events again. But from their perspective, it will be, it's not first person, but it, it, it gives us dialogue, which is things they've said. It gives us inner dialogue. You will have Holden want to think to say a lot of things and only say one thing, right? And then we have the narrator who can fill in, who does other things around, right? Sort of an omnipotent narrator. He could tell us everything. He tells us some things like, he thought this would work, it's not going to work. This kind of feel fills us in as we go. And, but, and between the two, right? And like I said, with the modern, where we, we concern ourselves with the personal, you, you, you start to care about these people and move the story way before you get bogged down with world building or everything else that you know is there and you know you're interested and the author's interested. The author wants to tell you, but but they these authors, I think it's James S.A. Corey, I think that's two people i think in any case they do a fan fantastic job none of the language is hard there's no big massive words you're not going to get lost in any kind of a way but it, it is exactly what you need to move through this through this story so it's I, you know they could have made it more more but then it would have actually detracted, right? You, you, these, these, all the words feed this story, and feed their concepts, and give you room for them, right? So in that way, it's exactly what they should have done. I'm not saying you know, poor, poor writing or anything like this. I think it's, it's, right, if I go too pretty with the writing, then it's changing what I have to be seeing. And then it's not what I'm seeing, I'm seeing something different. Does that make sense? Right, you can't have like Shakespeare I mean, what is it? Shakespeare's this best at describing these epic love stories or Caesar or whatever. But it's hard to talk Shakespeare and, and then show me, you know, this farmer is less interesting. It makes it more in, in when you when you read it. So he's he, the, the author stays right where he needs to stay. So between the language and then that pacing, that how I'm going to drip this information out, you just get caught up. Even knowing, okay, so even I, I watched season one and it follows a lot of the book. Even knowing what's going to happen, I found myself more interested, right? So it's it's almost like a second read through in a weird way. Which is another test, It's you know, the test of the story. I know what happens in Lord of the Rings. Why do I keep rereading it? Because the the journey it takes you on. The way it delivers it. It's fun to re-go over that. And same with this book. I think I'm going to reread it. Even when I get the full series, I'm going to reread it. 
a good amount of time probably. It's it's a good place. It's fun to be there. Right? And by fun I don't mean, you know, when they're in the slums, slums are fun or when there's when there's whatever violence that that's fun. I mean we're in space. We're on the spaceships. I like to go to space. It, it, those those are fun adventures. I'm, I'm getting they, that's why we read books. You get taken on these adventures without having to you know train and become astronauts. It's much easier, much easier. Um, sort of our perspective. Like I said, um, will because he's through Holden's eyes, so to speak then what's presented is through his eyes. So here's a ship and here's all this tech. He's used to the tech already. He's 30, whatever years old. He's used to the tech. He's been doing it for years. So we, is the, the author can't then stop and tell you what it is. With dialogue and some action, he shows you what it is. And then later, deeper in the book, he'll, he'll actually do the world building part like, and sort of cement it. In stone, right? So, if you weren't unsure, right? Like you, if you weren't sure what you saw, he then takes a moment to fully stop and explain it. But when you when you do it reverse, right? So a lot of authors want to tell you the rules and then play in the pool. Where if you start playing in the pool, then tell me the rules, it sort of solidifies thoughts I already had. If you do it right, obviously. They do it exactly right. And telling me the rules later is almost like a break, right? Because it's sort of higher drama, now a break mentally where I can just sort of rest on this rock. I know what we're doing. He's just laying out the rules. I do care. I am listening. But it is a bit of a break mentally before we get to the next block. And so if you like like music, you're pacing yourself. You go down to crescendo big. This kind of thing. They do all of this. And we have people who can get new arms. We we have data pads all over the place. Communication that takes time because it's going through space. We have the first ship they're on, they're um, ice mining. And you're talking about, you know, in your head you think smaller rocks because you're used to movies, but... In the ship, it'd be a glacier-sized rock, this huge, huge thing that you have to deal with. It's inertia and this and that. And that's the other thing I was going to mention. Another reason it works, irrespective maybe of whatever you think of the science or how much science you know or don't know, the science in this book is internally consistent throughout. There's never going to be some rule established about, you know, Gravity uh, hitting you when you adjust the, the the rocket ship, right? When you change directions, all that gravity hits you. You know the chemicals you need to be in you. They don't. He never loses track of his rules. So not uh, there's not going to be a ship that can do what other ships, you know, warp speed and all this out of the blue. All the rules are internally consistent. And internally meaning, here are the rules of space. And then here's how it affected these cultures. And then here's how time with those rules got us to where we are. All just as you're walking along, right? So like I'm, I'm in a new city and I'm just absorbing this as I look without losing pacing, without losing the story. It's very, very good. In the show, I at times was annoyed with the belters. We have Belters, Earthers, and Martians. These are people, Pelters are just people who live in space, right? And the way they describe it is you grow, they're very tall because there's no gravity. And over the years, their bones have got really long. They're like seven feet tall, eight feet tall. I think it's the least used detail in the book, right? It didn't come up as much as I think it could have. But that's a mom. I'm nitpicking now. It's a minor issue. But it's like their whole culture sort of bugged me in the show, versus now with the book and the in the way he delivers it, I, I then completely understand. There's a part where 
the Canterbury, the ship that they're on to begin with, right? He gets a distress call. It's a fake distress call. Which, again, the, the show added weird little elements that they don't have in the book. And the book works, again, as we know. The book's better. Now, if you just watch the show, you'll 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 get enough of the flavor. But the book is really great. I think it is better. In the show, they made like a big thing about holding, you know, lying about the distress signal. Versus in the in the book, we have a conversation about whether I want to respond to this. But it was never going to be a question. We were always going to respond. It's just who's going to take the heat for the money loss from the crew, right? And it's sort of we get a lot of unspoken things hashed out because the book can just sort of say the unspoken. In any case. When that sort of ice hauler dies, then Ceres Station, all the belters understand, we're going to have less water. Now, in some ways, I go, does that make sense? You don't run out of water. I'm like, no. But you do increase population, increases consumption. So you would need a constant increase because people never stop making more people. It's one of the things people do. But the way Miller describes it, because he has a a, um, a partner who's from Earth, and he's like, "Why are y'all freaking out?" And he goes, "You know, one one slip up in space on a space station, a ship, space station, or you know, built into an asteroid. One one slip up, you die. Space gets in, everyone dies." Right, you, you mess up some water filter, people die. Right? He says that's the reality. And he goes, We the belt we belters are the survivors. And it just click you know, it just clicks in my head. Generation after generation, and it just gets burned into their culture, their psyche. You check seals, you don't play with water, you don't do all the essentials. We'll fight over here, but not about this and that, right? This kind of back and forth. But for the for the punishment to be so severe and that generation after generation of survivors teaching kids, their survivors teaching kids, you would get a very hardened people about things, right? And it's those cultural rules are always worse than actual laws. The law can say, you know, don't let you know, flies in the pizza place. But, you know, people might allow it. But if the town, if the culture, for a hundred years has never let a fly in, then it's not the law he's getting in trouble with. It's his family. It's extended family, friends, people he meets in town, shame from on high, you know, from everyone. And that would keep them, that'd keep every fly out, right? So that this, it's merged into their culture. Completely explains a lot of how they act. And why they are the way that they are. And it's just, again, you, you grab the concept, and then instead of harping on it, you move on with the story. So my brain's working on the concept, and then more story comes, and then more concepts comes, and it builds like this. It's so, it's so excellent. It really is. Um... Then it wouldn't it wouldn't be sci-fi with you know two sort of elements. We got obviously our science fiction element, which you could say we got with the spaceships. Just seeing this uh, future projecting how humanity would live with spaceships and what that would look like with the Mars colony, with these asteroid colonies. What 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 would it look like? Is fun in in and of itself. We add obviously. Some more heavy sci-fi. But the groundedness, right? Because we come from a personal angle, we, we get a lot of insight into Miller's thinking, into Holden's thinking. That personal, the, the personal pushes us, and then we're more willing to accept the more outlandish elements. So we... we and that's always fun in a sci-fi to to delve into issues. The issues this one brings up is is moral issues, right? Um, 
their conversation about not responding to the SOS, that that was an option, tells me about the people, tells me that they are people, right? If you're out in space, it's dangerous. You're working hard. You don't want things to interfere with your money, right? But then, like normal people, you want that decision out of your hands. You don't actually want it. Most people, I say most people, don't want the responsibility of decision making. And this book shows you that. It shows that Holden takes that responsibility. But then there's the aftermath, right? So if you get to other sci fi books or other books in general, they'll go from like war to battle to war to this new dragon, new magic. New things keep hitting, and you don't ever see your heroes affected by it at all. Versus real life, if you get into, let's say, the close call, right? Like, let's say you had to hit the brakes one time on the interstate, and them things locked up and there's smoke and you swerve into the ditch. And it's this close to a massive crash. You just avoided whatever this horrible thing is. And then there's a fireball. That'll affect your week might affect your month a couple of months for some people right where it takes it uh, it hits you in waves the, the 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 event itself right this book does a good job of showing um they go through the canterbury gets attacked they get attacked they live they survive then they need they actually it, t- it says like we're here a week or two before they're decompressing they're getting over whatever happened to them. And then they're the new versions of themselves with that experience. Does it for Miller? It does it for Holden? So we have these these morality issues that come up. Do I respond? Um, release Just releasing information. Holden is dead set always on, here's what I know and I just feed it out into the net. And then, and then Miller brings up the conflict of filtering that information. He says, if you tell everyone everything, they'll just panic. Or they'll take it wrong. Or you'll start a war, or this or that. And then they have this, almost a debate as to what's better. And we don't come to a real resolution. We come to personal, right? Holden will release the information. That's just who he is. Miller won't until we get it all solved. But it leaves the reader... Thinking of which one they would be. What would you do? You know, if, if you had all the CIA files. Here, everyone's on every, an equal footing. I'm like, yeah, but now we know the French tried to take over England subterraneously or something. Right? It could cause conflict. But then you're like, is it a Band-Aid off quick situation? Would it be better just to rip the Band-Aid off? I'm like, you could say that. But if it starts a war and a lot of people die, maybe that's not good. Maybe we could have been without a war. You, it puts you in the shoes of those of those decision makers. There's one part, and then he um, they end up okay. Because it's going just as space, but we have this mystery of why the Canterbury was blown up, and it was blown up for some sort of something. Something in this Martian ship's safe. And then it, right, where it's like they're on a big space station. I forget which one it is. Ceres. Ceres station, I think. I believe. I'm not 100% because I didn't write in my notes. They released some kind of pathogen onto here. The pathogen killed uh, another crew. We know it's dangerous. They release it on here and just kill everyone with it just to see what it does. Right? Now, on the one hand, that's science fiction and it's interesting. I do, as a, as a reader, I want to know what this alien thing would do. But then our characters are horrified because they see what it's doing. And it, what it does is it'll just like tear everyone apart, re- restructure them in these horrendous, grotesque, but clinical ways, right? It, it, the descriptions never get too outlandish. But you are talking about rib cages splatter down and this kind of thing, so it's all night. It's grotesque, but not written like Saw or something. It's not harping on the grotesque. It's trying to just give it across to you. But, uh, but they find the guy responsible. 
And he's way off the deep end, or is he? Right? That's the question. What he's describing is a proto-molecule, a molecule from aliens somewhere in space, sent to Earth before, you know, humans were even real, billions of years ago. So he's like, we have an alien race with, that was already hyper-advanced when we were molecules. And they sent us this, and there's, they could still be out there. So in his, in his head, we have to determine what this protomolecule can do before we can use it. And his ideas are nearly limitless because the protomolecule can change things molecularly. And it survived in space. So he's saying, you know, there, there's no reason it can't, you know, make it so you can breathe in space. Make it so you don't die. Make your body bulletproof. You know, this, this, the concepts of, of the way it can pair matter together, he's saying, is limitless. And that we will need this. We will need to be able to crack this protomolecule before whatever comes to us comes to finish the job. In his mind, the protomolecule was sent to destroy us. Right? But he's selling them like this, right? And, and he's selling them that this thing is bigger than the million people that died on Siri Station. That, that those deaths are worth for billions of Ameri for billions of humans to then carry on and exist. Right? And it's a, a moral question we, that we've seen in history. Right? The um, Project Paperclip. Was it morally okay to get Russian, I mean, Nazi spies and bring them to America? It's what happened. Right? We, we, we didn't want to leave the rocket engineering and technology and get behind the, the Russians. Could have been a massive war. Didn't happen. Because someone somewhere made that moral decision to... Sort of overlook the Nazism of these of these scientists, right? And that's what they were having that discussion right in the middle of our book about. And then, of course, Miller's like, uh, "No, I'm just going to do what's right, and what's right is for you to die because you killed all those people, eye for an eye, in, in his mode, right?" And Holden doesn't like it because you should have had a trial. But Miller and Miller probably right where he was hearing that he would have got away with it, that what he's selling is too big. That sometimes right just needs to show up and just handle it. And if we don't have that, then we aren't going to be human much longer. Right? So, But it's this moral decision right in the middle. Um, in the show, it doesn't, it doesn't do a great job of explaining this. But it does better in the book. Uh, the Martians tend to have or can have Texan accent. So our pilot has a Texas accent for some real weird reason. I'm like, I've never heard of a Texas accent in space. It's my belief all people from space should have British accents. This is just, it's just proper. But this one has Texan, but they explain it where a good bulk of Texans and Polish people or something like this showed up in the, in the big valley. And that it just sort of stuck. And since then it just hadn't gone away. And I'm like, that makes sense. The early settlers are Texans. And um, well, we infected them with our accent. It's kind of cool. We have sort of space combat happening in here. It's a few times that it happens. Each time a sort of a bit different. The first time they're captured in a Martian ship. And it's sort of, you're just sitting along for the ride. And at any point... Some bullet can just pierce all the way through the entire ship. And you're just like, by luck, it'll just hit you or it just won't. It's kind of terrifying. And then other times they're in their own ship. So, you know, every time it hits G's and they have to change direction, all that load drops on your body because it generates all this gravity. And then they have, um, you know, medicine, chemicals that go into you to keep you from passing out or dying or whatever that happens. Obviously, you can't be on the on the sauce all the time. I love this concept. I, I, I love how it it limits the ships, it limits what can happen, but it doesn't stop people from trying. 
we get a war that starts because of course Holden's information they released and it's just on the sideline right it's we're a small ship the war's happening all around but we're this small ship going to do things it's very fun one of the bigger hurdles for me in the show I, I mentioned the show a lot it's just it was in my mind when I was listening one of the biggest hurdles was why they went back out. Right? So you're on the Canterbury. You're just ice haulers. And you get a new ship, a Martian ship, that you escape on. Then you get to safety. You get to Fred Johnson, the OPA, which are the, um, they're like the IRA with, with Ireland. They're sort of rebel types. I always wondered, because they didn't explain it as well, they sort of try and lean in to just go with it. But I'm like, why would you go back out into danger? And then some of it is, you get a better sense in the book of the time they've spent with each other. And that they're a crew. And not just, we work together. That even something as small as, let's say, um, ice mining is not frivolous you wouldn't you don't bring random people on a trip that could take x amount of months that you don't get along with that you're not friendly with right you have ties and so when it gets blown up it doesn't there's not just a job they had right it wasn't just a giveaway there were real connections they had with those people and that loss sort of drives a little of let's not sit on our hands here right and it sends them back out in the space and then of course once you're caught up and in it it's hard to get out but it, it explains how holden is the captain that they agree to and why they continue to go back out you know his his drive becomes their drive and i like that it, it works for me um what am i forgetting i talked about the proto molecule I had it on the tip of my tongue. Oh, right. The cultures. We have three main cultures. Martian, who, the way they describe it is, I keep getting these paper cuts, I don't know how. They, they describe the Martians as the first big colony and that they're very scientifically advanced. So their ships are the best. They have... The Belters, which is probably the largest in number. It's anyone with a random anything can live out in the asteroid belt. Some of these people have never been to Earth, never been to Mars, never been to a planet. They just fly around all the time. They're all long, they're tall, they're stretched out. And then Earth. Earth is Earth. And we get peeks into the conflict. Because you give any, any group of people and you make them groups, there's going to be conflict. And it, these are natural feeling concepts, right? Where out of sight, out of mind, right? For the planetary bodies, the Martians and the Earthers, they look sort of, and that the Belters look different. They're all stretched out and long. You kind of in your mind can then say, well, they're fine. We don't have to concern ourselves. We're the source of foods, of this and that, of our of humanity. We're above those people, right? Those people are sort of unwashed masses. And they should learn to act right. Because they act different, they're acting wrong, obviously. And both sides sort of think that. So they are just eyeing each other. Obviously, Earth looks at Mars, saying they have all that tech. What if they bring it on us? And then Mars is thinking, at some point, they'll think we're going to bring them something on them, so we got to arm ourselves. It's a Cold War kind of a situation. But those are the two big powerhouses because the belt is a motley. But the belt, that motley isn't completely individuals, right? You give any large body of people freedoms and they form their own internal governments, right? So that's what the OPA is. They're, they're criminals. They sort of make little fiefdoms for themselves. And over the generations, it's been building sort of an animosity. Obviously, natural animosities build, right? And But they give us hints of that, right? Where it's Miller with his Earth, Earth friend or Holden with the, um, 
the other crew members one of them is a Martian one of them is a belter and she they will have these conversations about you don't understand and then they're like I don't understand you what it's like you know when it rains or looking at the sky these kind of things and the, the effects that it has on them but you can see where their visions don't align sometimes and then in your mind you start to amplify that out and then by the time you're doing that the author gives you the rock solid of here's the lay of the land right and he shows you this, this tension that cracks when this Canterbury blows up and Miller you know says a Martian ship did it right it's sort of what it starts a big war everyone going after everyone and they're they're be all end all they're nuke the idea which didn't happen till much later in the show but they have an idea where at some point somebody is gonna chuck a rock at somebody meaning earth is earth it's stuck on its orbit it's open the sky is just open and the belt space is full of all these large objects you could just slap rockets on it drive it at earth because you know where it's gonna be at all times or Mars plummet it on one of their cities right it'd just be catastrophic right and I'm like on the one hand it you know that makes a lot of sense to me to drop something from orbit what is it uh the Gundam show the early Gundam show does this too the Principality of Zion drops a uh, a huge colony a space colony right on the earth and it just decimates some stuff I'm like it would do massive damage and it is clearly a problem earth would face and Mars but then I'm like if you could attach enough rockets to it to move it where you want I suppose you would plan it right so I can just send it to this one loop it loop it loop it so it has this massive speed and then it's driving at earth but then Earth would see, so you know, I would think you'd have a radar web up somewhere hunting these down. You'd have to. And you'd have to have some system of rockets built to catch them and just move them. You just needed to glance it off. So the sooner you catch it, the sooner you can move it. But it is all of space you have to look at. Right, so that's the cat and mouse of defense offense. But I was wondering, you see, and that's what I mean about the internal logic of the book holds up. In, on the one hand, I'm like, not possible, but on the other hand, I'm like, it is. So I can go with that it is. That, that, that this is a consistent thought out amongst these peoples. And because it, it's plausible, I can go with it. Now, obviously, the, the planet side people don't think either side could do it because it'd be too catastrophic. Also, they don't see a world, a way you can survive without it. And then the belt's like, well, when they blow each other up, it'll be good for us because we will take supremacy. We're used to living in space anyway. So even with like, like your nuke, right? This is your space nuke. You have different ideas about, you know, the ramifications of it. Very realistic. The whole book stays the whole time. But I do, I do wonder about I think you could live completely in space if you just had water. Water gets you all the other stuff. You can grow your own food. Now, if you lost it, I mean, how do you get more plant life? You'd have to find another planet with plant life. Or, like you, like you, they're doing, you make enough space stations and spread enough seeds that you can never really nuke all of the people in the belt. But I do wonder at the defense level of Mars and Earth. Would you have thought up a defense to that? I think you would You would at least think you did, right? Which is uh, what that happened in World War II. You think your ships are going to work a certain way, but you don't know until the fight actually happens. And, you know, in this, in this universe, the, the people are primed for a fight. So when it goes, they just go with it. Ah, we got... Last but not least, Julie Mao. This is, okay, Miller's sent to find her from her rich dad. He finds her dead. You know, it's a sort of letdown. We get a whole cop drama about it 
right? It's your salty veteran comp. It's very well done. It really, really is. But through him, through him and his constantly thinking about her, oh, you end up with the sense of knowing a character that you never meet while they're alive. You see? It's very slick. So by the end, the proto-molecule is trying to figure out, it's trying to adjust. The way it's described, it was thinking it was going to deal with, you know, one-cell organisms, and it's dealing with this complex human structure. So it's getting a person, it's tearing them apart, it's reconfiguring them. At some point, we have, because it goes back to the station that's just completely overrun with the proto-molecule. And it has hands running around like little critters. It, it has, you know, things that are beautiful flying around that are, you know, who knows what it's made out of. Who knows what kind of combination of human parts and metal or structures if it's fused together. Who knows how it can power them. All this. But then he meets the Jumi Mao who ends up the heart, right? Sort of the, the beating heart of this entire... It chooses her. She's the one who lived the longest with it or something. However it chose, it chose her. And he has this, he's having this interaction, right, with this character that he's been hunting. And it, it, it's, a, it's, it's fairly touching, right? And you, they sort of both know they're going down, but they don't know sort of what's going to happen either because... Clearly, the protomolecule is doing things that are now out of the scope of knowledge of we, what we know. <laughs> it was heading towards Earth because that's where Julie wanted to go, but then he convinces her to go to Venus. And that's how the book ends. The book ends with this sort of this moment between this detective and this person he was trying to save that he had never met. The, this, this bond they form. How, who knows, how... Again, the protomolecule is just enough of that leeway you give to then make you accept. So when I like, they don't have any connection, but I'm like, I think they're kind of connected. You know, that strong desire he had, you know, found her as the protomolecule through her was reaching out for something, right? This is a great moment. So you see it's a series, but it doesn't end on a cliffhanger. It, it, if you just read the one book, I think it'd be contained enough that you'd be happy. Obviously, there's more happening in the world. And I, I, and I think anyone reading it, would clearly be very interested in seeing more of it. But you could just, in theory, read the one book and be satisfied. Right? But I think I'm going to go, I think, from the level of writing I got, I'm, I'm very confident in getting these other nine books. Because that's another thing. Just as a last side note, I get nervous after a book four or five that maybe you're beyond your skis as an author and you're not going to have enough story for me. But here, I think there's enough on the bone. And like I said, a lot of this mirrored the book, the show. I mean, very well. The, the show did an extremely good job. But it, mir it mirrored it in such a way that it felt almost like a reread, even though it was the first time I'm reading it. And that reread was enjoyable. It's a, it's a unique little test that I got out of it. Very enjoyable, even on a reread. Again, highly recommend. And I don't think I can do my clamp because I'm holding the mic. But add time. I did it anyway. I'm definitely going to have to find a mic. Th these are my books. Are my books as good as The Expanse? I mean, as good as Leviathan Wakes. I'll say mine are cheaper. <laughs> so for the price, maybe. You can get all of my, you know, you can get all of my books. For less than 20 bucks. Yeah, I'm going to go with that. Because I'm like, it's, there's a lot of meat on this bone. There's a lot of meat on the bone, and it's delivered extremely well. I think I covered what I wanted to cover. I'm not again. I didn't cover every little thing because, well, in this one I didn't have to. I got enough. I got enough just yapping. Um, like I say always, that these these. If you want to help the channel, of course you can subscribe. 
But, you know, if you want to buy the book, that helped really a lot, too. And I want to thank everyone for watching these. I hope this audio doesn't suck. I really do. I really do. I hope it doesn't suck. In any case, I got I to gotta get a mic. I'll see you lovely lot next week.